that uh, we've mentioned tonight that that are sick and we pray we just leave this over to you Lord we're weak but you're strong and you can heal them if it be your will whatever your will may be Lord we want that but we do especially pray for them Lord if it, if it is your will to heal them to give them strength to give them encouragement to to, uh, to get over their problems and their ill health others in our church that have problems Lord again we pray that you would encourage them to to uh, to put their trust in Christ for all these things and that you will that uh, you will see them through and uh, that you will provide strength for them go with us now tonight for to Bible study be with us in this study in Jesus name we pray amen okay we're beginning on this is number three number three in our series of what's the matter first Corinthians <laughs> First Corinthians chapter one still, and this is our beginning in our third lesson. And hopefully, you know, we will maybe pick up a little speed. You know, uh, forty-five minutes though goes so fast; you just don't really get much done each time. And we're beginning. We're going to just go back, actually, just quickly mention verse twenty-two, and go forward from that point in chapter one. Uh, and I want you to get the sense of this letter. Paul writing to the Corinthians. He's had the introduction all the way down to verse 9. And uh, now he's get, beginning to get into the body of his letter. In verse 10 and 11, we saw that they had some problems in the church. Actually, verse 12 brings out that the... the uh, the schism that they had one said I'm going after Paulus I'm going to follow Paul I'm going to follow Cephas so there was a division in the church we see that today in the churches if you know anything about particularly Baptist churches you know there's divisions in them all the time and God says that ought, ought not to be and uh, we come down now he's, Paul says you know we ought to be one in the spirit. He says uh, we all be together. He speaks about himself in fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. Here, he says, "I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, uh, lest any should say, hey, I was baptized, you know, in his name, or I baptized in my own name.'" And then he thought of another one. He said, the household of Stephanus, he baptized them. He says, then in verse 17, he says, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but preach the gospel. So this is the most important thing. Uh, not with wisdom of words, of course. And then we get into verse 18, and as we recall, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Now, as you remember, this is in the present active middle participle in the Greek which changes the whole thing it didn't this is not the preaching of the of salvation as you and I know it you know believe on Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved he's already he is preaching he's talking to those who are already saved and here it's the preaching which has to do with the salvation of the soul not the spirit verse 18 for the preaching of the gospel is to them that perish now literally in the Greek we'll get this uh, present participle here and present tense in here it says uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that again so you can get the whole thing for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are being saved that's a present tense you're already saved and now you are being saved and one day you will be saved <laughs> you're theologically correct to say that if somebody asks hey are you saved I'm saved I'm being saved I will be saved I have been saved Christ has entered into me, into me when I trusted him I'm guaranteed heaven I have been saved in other words I am being saved that is my life is being saved from the power of sin and one day he'll give me a reward for it if I live the way he wants me to so this is a continuous salvation and then I will be saved. That has to do with the body. 
the body one day at the rapture of the church will come up out of the grave and uh, it'll be redeemed and all three parts of us body soul and spirit must stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ see for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ you see to receive those things done in our body whether good or evil either reward or, or loss of reward so here he's talking about the middle tense here soul salvation or a life salvation salvation of your life there be a whole host of Christians who are saved and going to heaven but at the judgment seat lose their reward they were saved to go to heaven but they were never saved for the reward to enter the kingdom the kingdom remember is the kingdom that Christ is going to set up and those who are saved will enter the kingdom with him and the reward or is the inheritance the inheritance to rule and reign with him so there'll be some that will have the reward to rule and reign with him some that will not those that do not didn't have this salvation completed in their life ultimately this salvation will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ in, in, uh, by a measure of how much how mature your faith has, has become that's what Christ is going to measure it with how mature did your faith become during this life you'd be surprised you'd be surprised you see at uh, the weak faith Christians because number one they don't read their Bible faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God number two they whine and complain when God then allows things in their life so that they'll turn to him and trust him to get him get them over them over this problem this hump in their life instead they whine and complain and guess what many of them cry to God please remove this thing these things from my life and never let it happen again and you know what he does he removes them and they never happen again and guess what they don't ever progress so be careful what you pray for <laughs> God allows things for us to turn to him in our weakness for him to give us the faith and the strength to overcome so that our faith will be more mature because of of uh, the experience of using of trusting in Christ all right that's what verse 18 is speaking of to those who are being saved verse 19 for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring enough into the understanding of the prudent you know God says I, I don't uh, you know the wise of this world with all their wisdom is nothing you see is nothing uh, and uh, so he addresses that in the in these closing verses here before we get to our place this evening and uh, God even simply said in verse 21 for after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe he didn't say by foolish preaching now, interesting he says foolishness meaning that's what people think of it <laughs> preaching in foolish but those who don't want to hear it think that it's food do you know that the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ him dying come and dying we're being raised from the dead and coming back again it's utter utter foolishness to the world and particularly scientific men utter foolishness they think we're the biggest fools that there is <laughs> we do believe this Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Jews always want signs. But those of us who aren't Jews, uh, before we were saved, that is, we sought after wisdom and that's where philosophy comes in and psychology comes in and all the things of man in his, in, in his own wisdom. He's seeking his own wisdom and uh, God uh, you know God just he continues as we continue tonight to go on to just to show us that this is all just the, this foolishness of the world for man in his own efforts 
to try to seek after things that he can't, you know, that it, wisdom which is really foolishness in God's eyes, worldly wisdom that is. All right, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now, uh, if you will, we see that we, I have a, uh, a note here. Uh, trying to find out what it is. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Now, this, of course, is throughout the Bible. Turn to Isaiah 8 and 14. Throughout uh, the Old Testament, he mentions Christ as a stumbling block. Uh, 18, 8, 8, rather, 8, 14. 8, 14. There's several, but I'll just, you know, to preserve time, we'll just go no further than this. Therefore the Lord himself, no, verse 14, verse 13 and 14. Sanctify the Lord God of uh, God of hosts, sanctify and let him be your, uh, be your fear and let him be your dread and he shall be a sanctuary for, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, <clears throat> for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Israel and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and snared and be taken. Now, to understand this a little bit further, turn to Matthew chapter 22. Twenty-one, actually. <laughs> forty-three and forty-four. Matthew uh, twenty-one, forty-three, forty-four. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it, fall, it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, two verses. Verse 43 speaks of Jesus removing the reward of entering into the kingdom for the Jews and giving it to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, that mean he took away their salvation. He didn't say he took away their salvation. Those that believed in that day were still saved. But as a nation, he took away the privilege of ruling and reigning with Christ. And instead, he gave it to the church. But not to everyone in the church. Only those who are bringing forth fruit. You know what it says? Okay, you can be saved and in the church have that first salvation, but that second salvation of being saved not have that. And therefore, you're not bringing forth any fruit because that causes you to bring forth fruit. So, it's going to be to a nation, that's the church, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That means you're bringing forth fruits of the Holy Spirit who is living his life through you. And verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. All right, that's the same stone we were talking about a while ago. He's a stumbling stone. Shall be broken. That's judgment, folks. The Jews that stumble over him, that they are falling on the stone and they're being judged. That speaks of judgment. See, they're broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him the powder. And that's the Gentiles. In Daniel, when he comes back again, it's the stone that strikes the image. Do you remember that? And the image falls and the image stands for the world powers. And it grinds it to powder and it uh, just falls away. Immediately is destroyed and then the, the stone grows until it's a great mountain that fills the world. That stone striking the image is the great judgment that's coming upon the nations of the world at his second coming. It's grinding them to powder. The stone falls. So the grinding to powder speaks of judgment of the nations whereas Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. It speaks of the Jews. All right, back to our text, 1 Corinthians. Verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
I might put it a different way, but unto them which are saved. That word called, kaletos, is the word saved. Both Jews and Greeks, either one, either one or all, whoever believes, that is. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, he became very dear to you. He became the power of God in your life and the wisdom of God in, in your life. You don't need the worldly wisdom. You don't need psychology. You don't need uh, philosophy. You don't need all these other things of the world. The thing you need is the wisdom of God, and you find that in the Word. And that's why we study the Word. And that's why we should know what the Word is saying. And the more we study it, the more faith we have, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I want you to know by knowing the power of God, you also know that Jesus Christ is none other than God Almighty himself. That he is omnipotent because the power of God is omnipotence, meaning all-powerful. And wisdom means omniscience. So you're, you know, when you come to this point of trusting Christ, you understand that he's almighty and that he's all-wise. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, the apostle did not mean to say to us that God has any foolishness in him, <laughs> nor any weakness, because he's dealing with men. When one is omnipotent, all-powerful, and omniscient, all-wise, of course, there is no weakness in him, and there is no foolishness in him. But he's trying to separate the wisdom of the world to the wisdom of God, and in order to teach this so that people can understand in this very carnal church, he's saying, with all of your wisdom of this world, <clears throat> you see, God's foolishness is even greater. <laughs> God's weakness is even greater. So it doesn't hurt the scripture by him saying that because he's trying to use an he's it's in an it's il, he's illustrating in this sense and uh, down in verse 26 he says for we see your calling brethren how that not many wise men after the flesh <clears throat> not many not many mighty not many noblemen are called isn't this interesting out of all the Christians in the world that's ever been not many of them have been wise men after the flesh, but very few. You, you, you can't lead a wise one who thinks they know it all to the Lord to start with, particularly if he's schooled in the great universities and he's got his alphabet soup, you know, behind his name, PhDs and all these other things. He's already got it all, folks. He's already made up his mind. <clears throat> And this, in the world, in the world that goes, you know, that that's like this, that follows the people follow the wisdom of the world. They are saying something like this to the Christian who has the Bible: "Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up." Now, if this the average person you have met has ever treated you that way, think of those who are uh, highly educated and think that they really know it all, how they must think. It doesn't mean that God can't, in his, in his uh, election, elect these people and, and save them, bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. But it just simply says that, he says, he, he, Paul is sim simply saying to the Corinthian church, you see your, your calling, meaning your salvation, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus came down and chose his disciples, there were a lot of rich people there in Jerusalem. There were a lot of people that were big in the sciences that ta taught at the universities. And Why did he go call those people and make them disciples? He went out and, and got a bunch of old fishermen, poor fishermen, you know and uh, people who didn't have what the wise men had because so that's just the way that God has ordered has ordered the things to be. Trouble is with the world is that they're ma mainly over uh, 
impressed by their own achievements. <laughs> when you get over impressed by your own achieve achievements, not too many people can say anything to you that matters. Verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Do y'all remember the 8th Psalm verse 2? I think you should. I won't even turn over there. He talks about out of the mouth of babes. Do you remember that? Comes words of wisdom. Yeah. For God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You see, he gets more glory from taking something that is a base, low, foolish, see, and using it, you see, because it literally confounds the whole world. How can this be? He gets more glory out of it. Did you find that psalm? What's it say? Babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. Yeah. That thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Yeah. See, God's chosen chosen these things. Uh, out of the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Then in verse 28 he says, And base things of the world, base means the lowest, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not. Now, what do you what do you think he's talking about there? Things which are not. Those that haven't even been born yet. <laughs> Those that are chosen is yet to come. Those of the church age. And you'll get a you'll get a little bit of reference of that in uh, Romans four seventeen, when he was talking about these things that are not yet. You know, when he was talking to uh, to Abraham, the things which are not yet. Yeah, he's going to save them, save many of them, to bring to naught things that are. Things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Now, you're looking over in Romans, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Romans 4.17, what does that say? As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And he does this, that verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. <clears throat> but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Because of God, you're in Christ Jesus, see? And uh, we're made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification being set apart and redemption and then saved. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, this as he is written is an interesting passage and is found in Jeremiah chapter 9. Verse 23. I think y'all need to see this one. Chapter 9, 23. These are real wor words of wisdom from the Word of God. Y'all have it? Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now you see what he is saying? Don't glory in anything but one thing, that you know that you know the Lord. And the way that you know the Lord is through his word. And there's three things about God that if you really know God, you, you should know. 
Number one, that he exercises loving kindness. Now that's, sal that's your salvation. That's Jesus coming and dying on the cross. He exercises loving kindness. Number one. Number two, what is it? Judgment. The next thing is coming is judgment. Eh? That's the great tribulation and judgment of this world. Particularly. And our judgment too, of course. Our judgment in the sense of whether we gain reward or not. But you've got Christ coming, then you have the second coming in judgment. The wrath of God, see? And what's the last one? Righteousness in the earth. What is that? The millennium. That's right, the kingdom. So you have the first coming, the judgment of God, and the kingdom, the millennium. All there in that verse. Now, you see, the, the world thinks that the, wise, that the man who is really wise, you see, is the one that wins uh, uh, wins as far as wisdom goes. And the one that is mighty, you know, he's the one that wins the, the contest of strength and the one that uh, is rich, you know, he's got something to glory about too because look what he did, look at all the money he made, look how wise he was and strong he was in order to get rich. <laughs> I want to show you something. Turn to Ecclesiastes 9.11. <laughs> Yeah, come on. <laughs> I'm going to let somebody read that one. Somebody read it for me. Now, you see, the wisdom of a man says, if you go to school, you'll get this job because you're wiser. Sounds good, don't it? If you invest your money in the right thing, you'll become rich. If you do this, you see, that gives you something to glory in. And yet God comes back in Ecclesiastes and said, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. Now look what he says. But time and chance happeneth to them all. You know what he's saying? They were all in the right place at the right time. <laughs> if you get in the right place at the right time, you're liable to be rich too. <laughs> you look in history at the great men, the great world leaders, the great generals. There would have been a million other men that could have been great too if they happened to be there, but they weren't there at the time. Somebody else was. <laughs> you don't get anything from the wisdom of this world and what the world has to offer. It's being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> now that's a general wisdom that God is giving out for the world. Of course, he can direct your life in the way, in the way he wants to and, you're, and you can be in his will in accordance with what he wants you to have. And uh, God doesn't really give the Christian as far as riches. He doesn't give too many of them riches because he knows exactly what it would do to them. It causes cause them to leave him. You know? Uh, the same reason you don't give your little child when he was growing up a book of matches. You know he'd get himself burned. He'd get fascinated in it. And he'd hurt himself. And so God knows exactly what we need in our lives. And, uh, you know, I often t say this, that when we pray, make sure we always pray in God's will. Thy will be done. You know what happens to a Christian that don't pray in God's will? He's liable to get his prayers answered, but not by God. You know, the devil is there trying his best to do things in your life to make you think it's the Lord when it's not so many times. Now, he can't answer a prayer of the devil. Of, 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 uh, the, the devil can't answer any kind of a prayer. Can't cause things to happen in your life if you pray, it, thy will be done, because he doesn't know the will of God. God wouldn't allow him to interfere anyway. 
Yeah, right. So you don't you don't hear you. That's right, because you can't read your thoughts. That's true. Only God knows the heart of man. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> folks, God didn't. You know, it's you know if he, if he knew that he could give you these things and it wouldn't hurt you, God loves you so much he'd give it all to you. He'd get. He, he, he would make you, he would give you the riches of the world. He'd give you, if it was in his will. i got to put that back, if it's in his will. Because let me say this, that God loves you so much he doesn't keep anything from you. You remember the scripture when it says, you know, if your son asks for a stone or, or a loaf of bread, would you give him a stone? <laughs> Ask for fish, would you give him a scorpion? How much greater your Father in heaven? How much more does He love you? But you see, your riches is yet to come. So far uh, are these riches, or so great are these riches that, you know, God can't even reveal them to us. You know, I've, I've often said it blow our mind. There's just no way. It's coming, though. And they're ours, and it's going to be forever. So you don't own anything now. Everything you have is just borrowed, really. <laughs> your house, your land, you say, I own it. No, after you die and somebody else takes it. And after they die, somebody else will take it. It's just borrowed right now. Everything's borrowed. One day, though, God's going to give you something that belongs to you and it's going to be forever. If you earn it. <laughs> the earning of it is literally a yielding of yourself to Christ so that he can live his life through you and produce the fruits that he wants to, which then will bring reward. And that is the reward. All right, well, uh, we go now in chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. <clears throat> For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, two thoughts here I want you to remember. Number one, Paul had been talking about the wisdom and the eloquence of, uh, of this world, you know, and how they can... Uh, present whatever world, the, you know the things of the world in wisdom now he says but what I got here I don't I'm not very eloquent I don't come in excellency of speech I'm not an eloquent speaker I don't use all the proper necessarily all the proper persuasive language so I just simply come you see and declare unto you the testimony of God. I don't, I don't come in the excellency of speech or of wisdom. That is man's wisdom. So this is the foolishness of preaching again that the world says. Now in verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> this, is a, this, is a, this is a very important verse. I believe in 1 Corinthians. Number 1. You have a bunch of carnal Christians who can't get beyond the bottle, the milk bottle. They suck their milk bottle all the time. They've never gotten into meat. We're going to address that in the, in the end of this chapter and the beginning of the next chapter. And Paul is simply saying something different than what he said at other churches. In Thessalonica, the church at Thessalonica that we're preaching through on Sunday mornings, in three weeks' time he gave them the meat, and, I mean, the milk to start with, and meat and strong meat, all in three weeks. He gave them every great doctrine of the Bible, including the second coming, the kingdom, how to get into the kingdom, the rapture. All is in First, is in first and Second Thessalonians. When it comes to the Corinthians, <clears throat> he says, I don't want to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I'm going to preach to you. Because you're too much of a baby to understand anything else. Now, there are three verses in between us thought here, but I want to jump three verses to, to uh, contrast something for you. Verse 2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's milk. Those are the things surrounding the first coming. Now, verse 6. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are mature. The word perfect is mature. <clears throat> so there were a few in that church that had grown past the milk bottle. 
And so in verse 6, he says he was going to give some meat to them. Wisdom, see? This wisdom is the higher wisdom. It's not just the wisdom of Christ crucified, but it's the higher wisdom. And this is such strong wisdom in verse 6 that uh, he, he says it's not the wisdom of this world uh, nor the princes of this world that, that come to naught. But we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> Now, before any of you all came to this church, you didn't have this wisdom. You had what was preached up here in verse 2. <laughs> you had the milk. That was it. And some of you didn't even have that. By that I mean I've had some of you say, well, I was in a church where I hardly ever heard the gospel preached. <laughs> you didn't even have the milk. I don't know what they were feeding you. I guess yeah, they just had your milk bottle full of water, just water, and that's it. Uh, no, it wouldn't be water either. Uh, but what I'm trying to show is that Paul is making a statement here that he's not going to get into the meat doctrines in this uh, in these epistles to the Corinthians because they were too much they were too much like babies. They had not yet grown any, and they they weren't ready for it. Uh, look down in chapter 3, verse 2, and I'll, of course I'll come back to this later. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. <clears throat> For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Why? For ye are yet carnal, which means fleshly. Now you see and understand this, that milk doctrines or teachings are those teachings that surround and uh, uh, are part of the first coming of Christ, that teach the first coming of Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection on the cross and him going back to heaven. And it includes the rapture, by the way, resurrection. And it includes the beginning of the judgment seat of Christ, but it generally stops right there. It doesn't go any further and all the other things but from the judgment seat of Christ that is uh, on into the word what happens at the judgment seat the reward versus uh, the loss of reward the coming kingdom and the second coming and those who will rule and reign with Christ that's called meat and so all the doctrines that have to do with the kingdom are meat doctrines and here he's telling them, I'm not going to give you any meat doctrines. Because, why? Well, simply here, he uh, says that you're... Pardon? Yeah, he's, you're yet carnal. He says, all I'm going to do is, all I'm determined to do is, uh, to know uh, among you is to, is Jesus Christ and him crucified. I've heard a lot of preachers say, that's my watchword, not really understanding that's my watch word. I, I, I want to know nothing save Jesus and him crucified. And they used to boast that, you know. Not understanding what Paul was really saying here. Now in verse 3, I'm going to go back and carry, uh, take these three verses that I didn't take. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Here he came with no excellency of speech or of wisdom. He was in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing or literally persuasive words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. What me, he said, all I did was preach the right words and it was the power of God through those words. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That your faith should not, uh, <clears throat> should not attach itself to all the worldly wisdom, but in the power of God. And then he says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or literally mature in their faith, 
yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that not come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden mystery which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, this hidden mystery from the foundations of the world is a mystery that Paul talks about in Romans and that Peter talks about also. And next week we're going to go into that hidden mystery, you know, in a deeper sense so that you can understand it. But part of that mystery, it starts in verse 9 here. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath, uh, uh, neither hath have, uh, entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's a tremendous statement, folks. And I've used it many times in the ministry here because I want to keep bringing you back to what he has for you. See, those of you who are diligently seeking God, he says he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Did he say that? You've been diligently seeking. Let me say this to you on the authority of words God. You've got a dazzling future ahead of you. And it won't go for a week or a month or a year or five years or ten years or a lifetime. It'll go forever. Forever. And it's so great that I hadn't seen or ear had heard nor had it entered into the imagination of man. He can't even imagine it. And we're going to have joy like we've never had before forever and forever. And another scripture says, in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Every day, brand new pleasures that we've never even knew existed will be ours. But you have to understand the hidden wisdom and what the hidden wisdom compels us to do in our life. There is a commitment to Christ in a much deeper sense than just being saved. And that's what hidden wisdom brings out. It's that commitment of life that he wants you to live. We'll address those things next week. All right, any questions? <laughs> Father, thank you again for the hour and bless it to our hearts and dismiss us now in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.